Hello students, this is Professor McDermott. Well, so much happened in the 1960s that I've divided this lecture into two parts uh, to make it a little more manageable. The first part focuses on the brief administration of President John F. Kennedy, or as people came to call it later, uh, the period of Camelot. How did uh, John F. Kennedy uh, get elected? Uh, well, the 1960 election featured Kennedy as the Democratic nominee. Um, Kennedy was a member of a very rich and powerful Catholic political family in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, who was a U.S. Senator at the time. The Republican nominee was Vice President Richard Nixon, who had shed some of his old hardline anti-communist views and moved to the center in an attempt to get into the White House. However, um, the reputation of Nixon as being somewhat slippery and untrustworthy um, continued to stick to him. Uh, his nickname was Tricky Dick, and the question on everybody's lips was, would you buy a used car from this man? However, in all fairness to Nixon, it should be said that as far as um, corruption in this election, uh, it would seem that, that John F. Kennedy actually had his share. Um, one crucial primary election that uh, Kennedy especially needed to win uh, came in West Virginia, and there were many stories afterwards of Kennedy campaign staffers showing up in West Virginia uh, with briefcases loaded with cash, which they passed out to the impoverished voters <laughs> of that uh, state. Um, so much so that Senator Hen Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota commented later, quote, West Virginia won't need any public relief for the next 15 years, end quote. Um, one of the issues was experience. Um, Kennedy had been in Congress for a number of years as a representative and then a U.S. Senator, but he hadn't had a particularly distinguished career as a leader um, in Congress, and so superficially it looked like Nixon had him on the experience point. However, Eisenhower really didn't help Nixon's cause. Uh, when a reporter asked him uh, to name one idea that Richard Nixon had come up with that Ike had incorporated into his administration, Eisenhower responded, quote, if you give me a week, I might think of one. <laughs> um, another issue, of course, was religion. Um, Nixon was a, a, a Protestant, but uh, John F. Kennedy's Catholicism really was a major issue in this campaign, just as it had been for Al Smith. Um, back in 1928. And as with Smith, it was especially a problem among evangelical Protestant voters um, in the South who really believed that in, in politics and in everything else, all Catholics uh, were like robots who had to take all of their orders from the Pope. Um, and this sentiment was so widespread that Kennedy actually had to make a major policy speech in Houston uh, before a group of ministers on September 12th, 1960, um, just to say that, as a matter of fact, as president, he would be his own man. He would look out for the best interest of the country and not the Vatican. Uh, yes, he still had to say that in 1960, but um, it seems that that did alleviate the fears of many voters um, somewhat, and Kennedy did win this election. It was an incredibly close election. Uh, 0.2 uh, percentage points separated Kennedy from Nixon in the popular vote. Um, one very key state that Kennedy had to win um, the Electoral College was Illinois. And here again, we see some evidence of that corruption I was talking about. The Chicago mayor, Richard Daley, um, a Democrat, uh, swore that he would deliver Illinois for Kennedy, and he did. Uh, but looking at the vote counts later, it was quite mysterious. For instance, in one Chicago ward, there were only 22 registered voters, and somehow in that ward, there were 74 votes for John F. Kennedy. <laughs> well, however he did it, uh, Kennedy won the election and uh, was inaugurated president of the United States.
the youngest man ever to be elected president. Now, you may recall that Theodore Roosevelt was the youngest man to ever actually serve as president, having uh, become president after the assassination of McKinley, but Kennedy was the youngest to ever be elected at age 43. And in his uh, very famous inaugural address, Kennedy reached out to those younger voters, telling them that, quote, the torch has been passed to a new generation, end quote. And uh, really throughout the speech, he uh, came back again and again to the theme of sacrifice and service to the country, uh, appealing to these young, young folks and their youthful idealism. Uh, and the most famous statement in this um, inaugural address is, of course, quote, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, end quote. So the idea was he wanted to harness the energy of uh, young people in America to really try to improve society and the world. That's why uh, so many young people volunteered for the organization JFK started called the Peace Corps, uh, which was uh, designed to help uh, people in developing countries improve their standard of living and which still exists um, today. Uh, well, um, I just can't pass by the JFK inauguration without uh, mentioning that uh, Kennedy, who was a very intelligent man, um, insisted that the great poet Robert Frost um, give uh, deliver one of his poems at the inaugural. This was the first time a poet had ever been invited to speak at the inaugural. And uh, Frost uh, read this poem, which is called The Gift Outright. And I, I, I think this poem says a lot about America and who we are. So just if you'll bear with me, I want to read it to you. The land was ours before we were the lands. She was our land more than a hundred years before we were her people. She was ours in Massachusetts and Virginia. But we were England's, still colonials, possessing what we still were unpossessed by, possessed by what we now no more possessed. Something we were withholding made us weak, until we found out that it was ourselves we were withholding from our land of living, and forthwith found salvation and surrender. Such as we were, we gave ourselves outright. The deed of gift was many deeds of war, to the land vaguely realizing westward, but still unstoried, artless, unenhanced, such as she was, such as she would become. Well, I'll just leave you to meditate on that. Um, Kennedy's slogan for his administration was uh, the new frontier. What was the new frontier all about? Well, Kennedy was very much influenced by a book which had come out in 1958 by the economist John Kenneth Galbraith, which was called The Affluent Society. Affluent just being another word for rich. Um, Galbraith's argument was that, yes, America was the most prosperous country in the world at the time. It was the most prosperous country in the history of the world. But um, Galbraith worried that our prosperity was being frittered away on self-indulgence, really, on consumerism, on buying stuff like dishwashers and TVs and cars and going to movies and, 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 and so forth, um, and that we were neglecting to build up our infrastructure. Um, we needed to put more of these resources to the common good. Uh, to try to build up our nation as a whole, and if we didn't, we would lose out in the race between the superpowers. We would become a second-rate power, unable to compete with the Soviet Union, and we might find ourselves on the ash heap of history. And um, again, you can see the effect of Sputnik here, uh, the Soviet's uh, satellite, uh, that beat us into space, you know, again, this idea that we're losing the race and we've got to redirect some of our resources um, to build up the nation, not just our own nest egg. Um, and so Kennedy was determined to do that. One way that he tried to build up infrastructure was through uh, urban renewal projects, that is uh, clearing out slum areas in large uh, inner cities and often replacing them with public housing. Now, that 
procedure had a lot of problems that became evident um, later and in fact may have led to the destruction of many uh, neighborhoods and cities but um, it was motivated by the desire to improve the lives of the people in the inner cities um, another way JFK uh, tried to do that was through education um, by giving federal subsidies um, to local school districts especially in impoverished areas whether in cities or in rural places um, to try to raise the education standards for poor children um, this was very unusual at the time uh, it was something very new for the federal government to get involved in education this way also um, JFK increased uh, the minimum wage and he really wanted to start the Medicare program that we have today which is basically health insurance for uh, senior citizens and disabled people um, as it turned out like so many of his uh, dreams uh, they would not be realized until after his assassination um, during the Johnson administration when the national grief at Kennedy's death caused many of these programs to be passed uh, in his memory um, another goal that Kennedy had for the new frontier was uh, to build up the United States military uh, to compete with the Soviet Union but also now uh, to focus on the space race and to try to gain up gain the ground that we had lost to the Soviets and in order to achieve this um, Kennedy made a really ambitious promise he said that the United States would put a man on the moon by 1970 and so uh, NASA went into high gear trying to make this happen uh, and of course ultimately ultimately they did um, succeed in that uh, as a tribute once again to Kennedy's uh, legacy um, in terms of civil rights um, as we'll see, uh, progress was made under Kennedy on civil rights. Uh, to some extent, that was in spite uh, of the Kennedys rather than because of them. Uh, JFK and his brother, the Attorney General, Robert F. Kennedy, often had to be drag kicking and screaming into supporting the civil rights movement, and yet, uh, as we'll see, they did in a number of significant ways. Well, just to capture the mood of America during the New Frontier, uh, I'd like for you to listen to a song in the supplementary videos folder by one of my favorite groups, the Kingston Trio, um, that is called New Frontier. And I, I think it really captures the mood perfectly. So if you would, uh, go over to that folder and listen to that and then um, come back as soon as you're finished. Welcome back. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, what do you think? Uh, it's a peppy little song. It's a very idealistic song. Uh, it's a very happy song, but at the same time, it, it's really calling people to a sense of duty. Um, I think my favorite line uh, is, not for ourselves do we take this stand. Now it's the world and the freedom of man. So once again, that, that call to young people especially to get out of themselves and to go see what they could do to help their fellow human beings. Um, but at the same time, you see that it is linked to the Cold War. In other words, we're not just going to be promoting, promoting prosperity throughout the world, we're going to be promoting freedom. It's that old dream of Woodrow Wilson to make the world safe for democracy, and it's very, very much a part of the whole competition with the Soviet Union for the hearts and minds of people uh, all over the world. By the way, uh, in 1962, the Kings and Trio came out with a song. It was called uh, Greenback Dollar, and it was a hit, but the song could not be played on the radio uh, as it was originally recorded because the refrain has a line that's, uh, that goes like this, I don't give a damn about a greenback dollar. <laughs> and in 1962, believe it or not, you couldn't say the word damn on the radio. Um, gosh, how times have changed. Well, we'll come back to this later when we listen to a song from 1969 by Jefferson Airplane, and we'll see how much of that innocence of the New Frontier period really would be lost um, in, in, in the late 60s and how uh, the country would move into a very different mood. Now, um, like Truman, like Eisenhower, JFK was very much... Um, a cold warrior. Um, 
And uh, for us, during the JFK administration, the main problem point was Cuba. Um, now, in after the Spanish-American War of 1898, we uh -huh. did not take over all of Cuba, but we uh -huh. did install a regime in Cuba that was very friendly to the United States. And so Cuba was really our, our ally until 1959, when a revolutionary leader named Fidel Castro overthrew uh, the current government and established um, a new regime in Cuba. Now, um, this regime was hostile to the United States, certainly, um, and Eisenhower had approved a plan by the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, um, to try to destabilize Castro's Cuba. Basically, there were a whole lot of refugees who had fled from Cuba uh, during the revolution, and the idea was to give them weapons and to send them back over to invade Cuba and to topple uh, Fidel. Now, when JFK became a president, he learned about the plan, and he did decide to go through with the plan. Um, and so, in April 1961, these uh, Cuban exiles landed in Cuba at a place called the Bay of Pigs, but were humiliated by Fidel Castro's revolutionary army, defeated uh, very badly. And so the Bay of Pigs invasion really set a very negative tone for JFK's foreign policy. It was a real uh, humiliation for the United States at the beginning of his administration. And one of the results was that Fidel now made it very clear that he intended to create a communist system in Cuba, and he turned to uh, the USSR for support. And so uh, eventually 42,000 Soviet troops came to be stationed in Cuba by 1962. Um, and that led to the scariest crisis of the entire uh, Cold War era, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, on October the 15th, um, 1962, um, Kennedy went before the nation to announce that um, a U.S. spy plane had taken pictures of missile launchers that the Soviets were building um, on the island of Cuba, missiles, nuclear missiles that would be pointed at American cities. And um, you have to realize that, that Cuba is only 90 miles from Miami, Florida. So it would have been very easy for the Soviets with these missile emplacements on Cuba to wipe out um, many population centers in the United States. Um, and so Kennedy announced that the United States was going to impose a blockade on Cuba. I'll come back to this, but I uh, just want to show you on the map here, basically... The blockade was the zone inside that red circle, and so the idea was that the U.S. Navy would prevent any ships from uh, entering the blockade zone and from getting to Cuba, the idea being to keep the missiles um, out of Cuba. Um, and so then, for several days, uh, the world was plunged into a state of high tension, and if you ever talk to an older person who was alive during the Cuban Missile Crisis, ask them uh, if they remember it and what they felt. I, both my parents said that they were absolutely terrified. They were convinced that World War III was going to happen and the world was going to come um, to an end. And that feeling was very widespread. Many people retreated into their bomb shelters if they had one. Uh, a guy in Florida got rich selling canned water. This was in the days before um, bottled water, but uh, he made a killing selling uh, canned tap water uh, for so that people could stockpile in case there was a nuclear Armageddon. But fortunately for the world, um, Kennedy and Khrushchev looked each other in the eye, and as it was said later, Khrushchev blinked um, and backed down. And so he ultimately agreed to take uh, or to not uh, send the missiles to Cuba as had been planned. What was not known at the time was that we also had to compromise with the Soviets and we removed some missiles we had uh, in Europe that were pointed at the USSR. So a, a deal was cut and the Cuban Missile Crisis was averted, but this was the closest that the world 
ever got to nuclear war um, during the Cold War era. Another flashpoint, of course, for Cold War tension was Berlin, as I mentioned earlier. Um, now, again, West Berlin was an enclave of the free world within the communist world and within the communist nation of uh, East Germany or the German Democratic Republic. Um, and so it was a place where people from East Germany could escape to the West. Um, so basically they just had to cross the border into West Berlin and eventually they would be able to get out to West Germany or some other Western nation. Um, and this became such a problem for the East Germans that uh, Khrushchev gave permission for um, the East German Communist Party uh, to build a wall around uh, West Berlin. And so one morning in 1961, the residents of Berlin woke up to find that the entire city of West Berlin had been surrounded overnight by a concrete wall. Now the wall was not finished. Uh, it would take years to, to finish it and make it the, bar the formidable barrier it really was. But um, uh, the essential components of the wall were in place that, w that one night. Um, and so that really changed uh, the world and, and uh, brought the Cold War, became the, made the Cold War become very hot all of a sudden once again. Um, so the United States retaliated uh, by uh, increasing defense spending, um, making more missiles and so forth. Although one of the reasons why Khrushchev had allowed uh, the Germans to build the wall was actually um, fear of increased U.S. defense spending. Uh, at least that was his excuse. Well, to dramatize the situation in Berlin, John F. Kennedy decided to go to West Berlin and to give a very famous speech standing right in front of the Berlin Wall on June 26, 1963. And in this speech, he uses the German phrase, Ich bin ein Berliner, which means I am a Berliner. I am a resident of Berlin. And I'd like you to watch an excerpt from this speech. It's the next video, excuse me, in the supplementary videos folder. So if you would go and listen to Kennedy speak and then um, come back and we'll, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit. Welcome back. Well, uh, very powerful Cold War rhetoric from President Kennedy, I think a very effective speech. Um, and really goes to show that um, Republican and Democratic presidents during the Cold War essentially had the same anti-Soviet policies. There was very little difference um, in, uh, in, in tone or style, at least uh, up to the administration of Richard Nixon, and, you know, or in policy in terms of Republicans and Democrats towards um, the Soviets. And it was during the Kennedy administration that we began to get deeper and deeper into the situation in Vietnam. Now, when we last left Vietnam, uh, there was a North Vietnam ruled by the Communist Party under Ho Chi Minh, and South Vietnam, which was still part of the free world, which uh, the United States was trying to keep from going communist. Well, in 1960, Ho Chi Minh, or Uncle Ho, as he was often known, uh, announced that the North Vietnamese were creating a new military force uh, called the National Liberation Front, or in Vietnamese, the Viet Cong. And the goal of the Viet Cong simply would be to take over South Vietnam and to make it go communist. And so in 1961, uh, Viet Cong had uh, infiltrated South Vietnam and had begun uh, attacking key points um, in, that, in that country. And so Kennedy, uh, felt that he had to um, take extra measures to try to defend South Vietnam from going communist, according to the domino theory. And so by the time of his death, we had 16,000 military advisors, not ground troops, but military advisors in Vietnam. And it, it's a very interesting question. You know, if Kennedy had lived, would we have gotten as deep into the Vietnam quagmire as we did under Johnson. My own personal view is yes, because Kennedy was every bit as much of a cold warrior as Johnson, but 
Uh, some people think not, um, and unfortunately we will never know. Um, in terms of civil rights now, of course, when we think of the civil rights movement, the first person that comes to mind is Dr. Martin Luther King. But it's important to realize that King was only one leader, and that his organization, which was called the SCLC, or Southern Christian Leadership Conference, was only one um, organization engaged in the civil rights struggle. Uh, another very important group was founded in 1960, um, and the reason for its founding uh, was that in 1960, a group of young students in North Carolina uh, began to uh, try to integrate lunch counters, segregated lunch counters uh, in that state. Uh, and so they would do what they called sit in at the lunch counter. They would just go in and sit down at the lunch counter and wait to be served. And of course, they were subject to a great deal of harassment and intimidation. Uh, often, uh, the other diners would pour the sugar from the sugar shakers on their heads or, or put ketchup or mustard on their faces or um, clothes. So it took a great deal of nonviolent courage for uh, these students to sit there and take that um, to try to integrate those lunch counters. Well, to harness the energy coming out of these student uh, lunch counter sit-ins, a new group called SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was founded by a woman named Ella Baker, a very important civil rights leader. Um, a third group I already mentioned that was founded during World War II was CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. So you see um, these three very significant civil rights groups, and there were others involved in the movement, uh, but uh, they often didn't agree on strategy and tactics, and uh, it's interesting, that was especially the case in Albany, Georgia, but I'll, 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 I'll talk a little bit more about that again later. In May of 1961, CORE um, declared that it was going to try to integrate um, bus service uh, between the states. Now, city buses had been integrated after the Montgomery bus boycott, but uh, interstate buses like Greyhound and Trailways uh, were still um, segregated in the South. And so CORE, uh, CORE's plan was to send a group of integrated blacks, uh, an integrated black and white group uh, down into the South on buses um, to integrate the buses. But as soon as they announced that, they began to get um, hate mail, death threats, uh, warnings of terrible punishment that were going to happen to the people on these buses. And so CORE uh, basically pulled out. It just got a little too hot for them. Um, and so at that point, SNCC stepped in with their youthful uh, bravery and enthusiasm and said, no, we're going to go through with it. We're going to take over the freedom rights. Um, and they did. So mostly young students, black and white uh, students, um, got on buses and began to um, travel through the south and the results were predictable. You see on the picture on the left, famous episode near Anniston, Alabama, when a Greyhound bus was uh, firebombed and torched uh, on the side of the road there in Alabama. Um, but the Freedom Riders were able to make it to Montgomery, Alabama, where in the Greyhound bus station they were surrounded by white supremacists, mainly Ku Klux Klan members, and um, beaten within an inch of their lives, and many of them uh, wound up in the hospital. At that point, um, Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, felt that he had to do something. Um, once again, this was an embarrassment to America in terms of its public image abroad. And so, um, Kennedy, Robert Kennedy decided to send 400 U.S. Marshals um, to Montgomery to, to stop the violence, to protect the Freedom Rides. And at the same time, he applied to the uh, Interstate Commerce Commission uh, for a ruling that the Interstate Bus Service had to be desegregated, uh, which was successful. So the Interstate Buses were finally desegregated, not by court order, but by um, decision of the Interstate Commerce Commission under the Kennedys. 
Um, another episode, somewhat similar to the uh, Eisenhower Little Rock intervention, took place in October 1962 when a young man named James Meredith wanted to integrate the University of Mississippi at Oxford uh, and met with the same kind of resistance that the Little Rock Nine had. Um, and so this time, President Kennedy sent the Army uh, to Mississippi to escort Meredith into the university and to protect him uh, as he enrolled uh, there. So a couple of big victories for the Civil Rights Movement under JFK, but perhaps the biggest victory was yet um, to come, and that was in Birmingham, Alabama, one of the most segregated cities uh, in America. And uh, under King's leadership, a uh, civil rights campaign to eliminate segregation in local businesses began in April 1963. And this really became famous and notorious worldwide because it was in Birmingham that the Sheriff Bull Connor um, sicked dogs on young protesters, uh, many of whom were children, um, and also uh, brutalized them by spraying them with high pressure fire hoses, which can cause a great deal of pain. Uh, and these pictures and images went all over the world, led to a tremendous amount of outrage. Uh, and so ultimately, the Birmingham campaign was successful. But it might not have been successful had it not been for lessons that had been learned previously in the city of Albany, Georgia, where there was a very spirited civil rights movement uh, going on in 1962. Um, and this is the subject of our edit extra credit assignment, so I won't talk about this too much now. But I would encourage you to do that assignment, or even if you don't write the essay that will get you the 100 points, to um, at least watch the video uh, which talks about the Albany movement and, 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 and discusses why the Albany movement was unsuccessful, uh, quote-unquote, uh, whereas the Birmingham movement was successful, and, and what the Birmingham campaign learned from Albany. Well, um, after the Birmingham crisis, um, Kennedy finally was ready. He felt public opinion was ready for him to make a major public statement on the issue of civil rights for African Americans, and so he went on television on June 11, 1963, um, to announce that he was promoting uh, a civil rights act uh, in Congress to try to eliminate segregation and to protect black voting rights uh, in the South. And during that speech, he said these words, quote, we preach freedom around the world and we mean it, but are we to say to the world that this is a land of the free except for the Negroes, that we have no second class citizens except Negroes, that we have no class or caste system, no ghettos, no master race, except with respect to Negroes." End quote. So here once again you see the Cold War uh, influencing Kennedy's thinking. How can we go around the world talking about freedom against the Soviets if a, a large group of American citizens don't have freedom here uh, at home? Um, and so the Civil Rights Act was proposed, but once again would have to wait until the Johnson administration. And the famous March on Washington in 1963, where Dr. King made his I Have a Dream speech, um, was an effort to support the Civil Rights Act uh, that Kennedy had sponsored. But um, Kennedy obviously didn't have longer, did, didn't have much longer to live. Um, and uh, of course, of course, you're all familiar with this tragedy. Um, and once again, if you talk uh, to an older person, ask them if they remember where they were uh, when they heard that President Kennedy had been assassinated in Dallas, Texas on November 22nd, 1963. And I can almost guarantee you they will remember. My mother remembers where exactly where she was, and she can tell you in great detail um, what she was doing and what she felt when she heard that Kennedy had been assassinated. Um, came as a huge blow um, to Americans who it was so totally unexpected because even though he was actually very ill with Addison's disease, Kennedy projected an image of um, youth 
and vigor. And of course, he had uh, a, a beautiful wife who was a very, very cultured and dignified woman, Jacqueline Kennedy. Uh, they had two small children in the White House, um, and it, it, it just seemed impossible that, that his life could be cut short um, at such a young age. Um, and uh, it just so happened that on Broadway at that time there was a musical called um, Camelot, which was about King Arthur and Queen Vin Guinevere, uh, and how they had, for one brief shining moment, managed to create a kingdom of justice um, and peace in England. And so um, that name Camelot began to be applied to the Kennedy administration, that it was one brief shining moment um, before the uh, United States was plunged into cynicism and darkness, um, as we'll see, as we'll see later. Um, Kennedy, of course, was shot by Lee Harvey Oswald um, although uh, there are, of course, many conspiracy theories and people who believe that Oswald did not act alone or that he was instigated by the communists or by the CIA or by Lyndon Johnson. Who knows? There are a million theories out there. Um, we'll never know the answer, uh, primarily because uh, a couple days later, Oswald was being moved from one facility to another, and a Texas nightclub owner named Jack Ruby was lying in wait for him and, and, and killed Oswald. And so Jack Ruby was found guilty of murder. He was sent to prison. Um, but uh, he never clearly stated what his motives were. If he was working for someone, uh, made some very confusing and contradictory statements. And so a commission that was put together under the Chief Justice Earl Warren found that Oswald had acted alone, that there was no mystery. Uh, but for many Americans, we'll never know the answer. Um, to the story of the Kennedy assassination. Kennedy, of course, was buried in Arlington National Cemetery, and at the top right you see the uh, very touching monument that was erected to him, the Eternal Flame. Well, we'll continue in the next lecture with the administration of his successor, President Lyndon B. Johnson of Texas.